welcome to this episode of Chain Conversations. My name is Laura McQueen and I'm the MD here at Leaders. This season is part of a programme called the Leaders Meet Diversity series, which we've been running in partnership with Facebook for a couple of years now. Chain Conversation brings together leaders from a variety of backgrounds across professional sport to share their personal stories, to reflect on their own career journeys, pinpointing some peaks and troughs, some helps and hindrances along the way to share with you. The premise is simple really. Person A picks person B to interview, person B picks person C to interview, and so on and so on. So over the course of the coming months, you'll really get exposed to quite a lot of um, independent personal journeys throughout the, the sports industry. The aim is to inspire you, to energize you, and to showcase why diverse thinking and diverse opportunity makes for a better business across sport and beyond. I really hope you enjoy it and speak to you soon. Welcome to the next edition of Leaders Chain Conversation Series with myself, Dion Dublin. And today I have chosen to speak to somebody that uh, you might recognize from the television. She's BBC Sky Sports Football. She's BBC Golf. Bit of football focus with me as well. She's, uh, she's all over the place, but I love her all the same. Miss Ailey Barber, how are you? I am good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad at all. How's, uh, how's lockdown treating you? Second lockdown. Well, we don't have a second lockdown north of the border. We have a tier system. So You're gloating I already. Have... You're gloating already. I am. I am <laughs> gloating. We had a long time with lockdown that you guys didn't. So now it's our turn to gloat. But no, I've just been and had lunch with a friend. It's a little cake and coffee. I delightful. remember those days when you could go out for lunch. And <laughs> yeah. It's a long time ago. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, we do what we have to. But um, I am hoping that that we're kind of not going to see another full lockdown up here because it's um it's not fun as we all know okay uh, can you take me back can you take me back to the beginning how did it all start for you where did it all start for you and uh, probably when i was about 12 years old um sitting watching grandstand as i did on a saturday every saturday before my dad and i went to the football grandstand and beyond and i remember watching it one time and it must have been the first time, if not one of the first times, that Hazel Irvin had ever presented it. And the minute I saw her do that, I thought, that's something I can do, because it's the first time I'd seen not just a female, but a Scottish female. And that was a big thing back then on national TV to hear a Scottish accent. So um, it was completely relatable, you know, everything I could say, Scottish female, Scottish female so that's where I kind of realized that it was a possibility so yeah that's probably where my obsession with it started. So so from that moment when you see um, the very first one did you think to yourself well I couldn't see myself actually doing that I have the attributes even at 12 that you know I could see myself doing that job. Yeah it's that whole thing of you, you don't want to be what you can't see. And although I'd seen it on Scottish TV, there was Scottish females doing football highlights and, and mm. sports coverage. Well, obviously Hazel being one of them, but there were a number of them in Scotland, but it didn't seem such a unique thing until a Scottish woman did it on national TV, on Grandstand, which like, let's be honest, Grandstand was like the <laughs> biggest deal growing up. Huge. Like that was the one that you watched every Saturday. If, if, if my team were away from home and we weren't going to the football, Grandstand would have been on for like the full six, seven hours, however long it was, in my living room on a Saturday. You'd be there watching. So how did, how did you, what was the first step for you? What was the first step on the ladder? You, you didn't go from, you know, you know, learning about your trade to presenting. There must have been some gaps and some steps you had to take between hand. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that really people knew, you know, when you go and see guidance counsellors and stuff at, at school and you say, I want to be a sports presenter, broadcaster, whatever, they don't really know where to direct you. So um, I did a course at Stirling University, which um, they were one of the first to combine sports studies and film and media studies together. Mm -hmm. So um, the sort of broadcasting degrees were starting up about then, but sports and media together was like 
the kind of marriage that I wanted to go down. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I did that. And at the same time as I was doing that, I was actually really lucky. I grew up in a really small village in, in Scotland, north of Perth. And in that village was someone you may have come across, Andy Gillis. I don't know if you've ever met yes, him. Yes, he was really yes. involved in Five Live. Um, and he was, yeah, one of the big main guys at Five Live. And he was brilliant when I told him and spoke to him about what I wanted to do. He he took me to games, he took me to press conferences, he gave me my first ever official work experience job at, at the Open at Troon back in, it must have been 2004, 2005. Wow. Um, wow. And I was a runner, yeah. Uh, work experience stroke runner back then, so. Did, um, so, so was, did was Andy, would, would Andy be like, would he, like, like one of the leaders for you? You know, we're talking about leaders, would he have been one of those people you go, can you help me out? Yeah, I mean, it was in a small village, everyone goes everyone. So he was my brother's best friend's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, but he was amazing. And he, like, I have said to him, but, you know, just how he was able to just take me along to things. And that really continued to sow the seed of, oh, I want to be involved in this. I want to do this. You know, the buzz that you would get from, from little things happening and being at these events and being able to, you know, he was, he's such a good broadcaster as well. I mean, mm. when he was doing the golf, he was producing it. He wasn't, he wasn't broadcasting, but he introduced me then to John Beatty, um, ex-Scotland rugby player who does a lot of stuff in Scotland for Radio Scotland and various things. And John was then the next person who kind of really helped integrate me in. He gave me my first paid job, which was, as a yeah runner doing a series of sports programs over the summer <laughs> so um for, for radio scotland so yeah those two right at the very start were were really influential and yeah i owe them a lot and did you find that because you were a lady that you had to do more work harder overcome more red tape do you know it's a weird thing it's something that i've not really thought about until later um, Until I asked people like me asked the question. <laughs> no, no, it's something that I kind of have kind of I have discovered that it's true without knowing I was doing it. If that makes sense, um, I've always grown up like playing sports, and I've always grown up. My class in primary school had twenty seven boys and five girls in it. Like being a a girl in a male, you know, it's not been an unusual thing for me. All my cousins are boys. We always played football together. We Everything we did back when I was young would involve boys and girls together. And it was never something that was unusual for me. But I have discovered, I think, as you sort of go through this industry, that I possibly do put more pressure on myself to know things um, because I don't, I still don't think I can get away with making a mistake or forgetting a name or whatever it might be in the same way that perhaps guys can. Um, but that might just be in my head. You know, you I don't like know, you... but that's the pressure I put on myself. So how, how, obviously, obviously that's not fair. And we've all made mistakes uh, when we're presenting. Do you feel like you've had to take on more work harder, overcome more no's than yeses in order to get where you are today, rather than for me, as because, you know, I was a footballer and you sort of, you're given it, you're given, you know, the, the media spotlight, whereas you really had to dig in. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would have had more no's than anyone else. I think probably everyone gets a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a difficult industry to kind of break into and I was pretty adamant that I was going to do everything I possibly could to to try to get in there and I took a lot of no's but eventually you'll get the little yeses that you're stuck make in there the, kid make it worthwhile um and you know I look I look at everything and I just think I'm so lucky and to have been given the opportunities that I've been given and mm. you know I I do work hard and I do try and do everything I possibly can to ensure that that my knowledge is there and 
I think like I don't have to work on the passion. Like I I love sport and that it comes out like, and it comes out in your presenting <laughs> as well. It do, it does. You're smiling. You're you're happy with with what you do. You love what you do. You and I worked on the uh, uh, the women's World Cup. And you're there, I'm just there doing what I do, messing about. You're doing your notes and your research and you're making sure everything's <laughs> spot on. And all I've got to do is talk about the game. But you've got to you've got to do so much behind the scenes to do what you do and be on screen as well, live, BBC. It's huge. Yeah, it's massive. And I think as well, like, I always kind of have to feel that when I'm there that, I have that knowledge there and that kind of takes that side of the pressure. If you know what you're, if you know your subject, mm. it takes the pressure off. You kind of only really need to concentrate on the actual live bit, yeah. <laughs> the actual speaking bit. Um, so I do, yeah, I, I do feel like I do work hard and I have, it's, uh, uh, I do have my producer at, at Sky has been um, very good and kind of, giving me lots of feedback and stuff because this is the first doing the Scottish football is sort of the first presenter job that I've had that's constant week after week after week after week so it's the first time I've had an opportunity to kind of plan progression in terms of how mm. how I present and to grow and to develop and um, rather than kind of doing one and then three months later doing another one and um which is quite hard but so my producer at that guy has been very good and he keeps saying to me you don't you don't need to say too much and I'm like but I need people to know that I know what I'm talking about like that's why I'm saying it and he's like look people know you know they'll, they'll get that you know what you're talking about by the conversations you have you don't need to throw in a million stats you know and that I think goes back to what you were saying about you know having to kind of ensure that people know you know what you're talking about and stats don't I mean everyone can read a stat off a stats yeah, pack you know it's but yeah that's but apart from of... that but apart from the presenting side of things which is possibly your main that's your main focus at the moment you've you've got a you've got a few few strings to your bow did you go to South Korea teaching or something <laughs> I've, I've heard yeah that was a that was a kind of means to an end that one um I needed to, I need, at that time, we obviously didn't have as much kind of, like I feel now the media industry is very well looked after and that if you are a young person trying to break in, you will now be looked after a little bit better perhaps than in the past. So when I was trying to break in, everything was free. You never got paid for anything. You paid for your travel. You got to where they needed you to be. You worked all day for like, <laughs> nothing back but it was like that was the way you get your foot in the door that was how you did it you know I mean I say back then it was what would it have been about 15 years ago or something yeah. um, Wow. and I feel like it's now a lot better for for young people trying to get in or, or people who are straight out of uni like I was straight out of uni moved to Edinburgh which was ridiculous most expensive city in Scotland moved there no money <laughs> <laughs> trying to get a career in the in media so I went to South Korea to basically get myself a little financial war chest to come home. And the idea was I would come home and I would spend six months. I reckoned I could survive six months without having to work. Mm. So I'd spend six months knocking on doors and phoning. Okay. Oh, and I see what you mean. Okay, so, yeah. so collaborating money, spending yeah. that time, right, I will be knocking on doors. I will be making sure I get into this industry that I've been wanting yeah. to get into for so long. So yeah, that was the idea. I paid off uni debts and got myself a little, like, little financial packet. Came back and yeah, eventually did get um, my first contract with STV, Scottish Television, doing their football yeah. highlights program. So yeah, oh, and that yeah, just everything's kind of gone from there. So so Korea was not my favourite year. If I look back, it's definitely a better year than 2020 has been, but <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably the next one up. <laughs> yeah. It's better, better, better than anybody else's, by the way, let me tell you. You know, you know during, during this time of, of you um, working your way up the ladder, have you come across leaders yourself and thought, you know what, I could learn something off that person and sort of gravitated to them or they've been around you already? Yeah, loads of people. Um, I think 
there are a lot of people who like you'll know yourself presenters and stuff that that you look at and that you kind of you don't emulate yourself on but mm -hmm. you want to take little pieces of what they do well and and there are so many in our industry I, that I admire and mm -hmm. and listen to and watch and you know and not just not just females there's a lot of a lot of the guys as well um I'm not going to mention everyone's name or names but you know there are and I love the different styles that people have but it's that the thing that I think probably I struggle with the most is that being able to own your space you know when you're like you're really good at it like when you're on like that's my time and my space and and I and I have like this is where I talk and get my opinion across or say my thing and sometimes I find it quite difficult to kind of own that if you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, are you finding it more now though because own, yeah. owning your time owning that presenter's space yeah I think you I think it comes with belief like that belief that that you should be there and that you kind of deserve to be there because I think initially I was kind of what am I doing here that, that, that you know <laughs> like, like pinch myself but also you know it's it's just trying to to get that belief yeah. that you know that you that you should be there especially when I'm like sitting there and there's guys like yourself whatever I've watched play football like growing <laughs> up and I'm like how can I be sitting next to this lot <laughs> you oh, know it's quite it's surreal do you find do you find that um as we talk about women in general and the game of football is it is it is it getting the platform it deserves women football I think I think so. I think I mean you saw at the World Cup the viewing mm. figures were unbelievable, and I think <laughs> now, oh, I couldn't believe it. It was it was incredible, and the atmospheres within the stadiums, and you know we always know that the Americans are going to have a good following, but that final with the, the Dutch fans, and, I mean, it, oh, and the city of Lyon as well, you know, just football fans everywhere, and it was, you know, the Americans do it so well, you know, you see like whole families walking down the street they're all wearing American tops and it didn't matter if it was mum dad brother sister whatever they all had a a rapino on the back or a morgan on the back you know like it's, they did, it's, they did. it's cool and I feel like that is becoming more normal certainly in England um Scotland's behind but you know we're behind in terms of where our level of football is in general in Scotland when it comes to the women's game, certainly. And, um, you know, Scotland have only been in two major championships, so it's growing. But in mm. England, with the the support of the clubs and 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 the players that are coming into the, the WSL, I think it's definitely having a platform. I think the important thing is that it doesn't try and do too much too soon. Yeah, agreed. You know, you don't want to miss any steps out and try and, you know, you want to capitalise on what's happening right now and, and the attention and the focus and the fact that there's a home European Championships coming up um, in England. You want to capitalise on all that, but I think you have to make sure you do every step. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, one of the things as well, as we were we were in France together with the Women's World Cup, it was, it was, it was so big and it was so buoyant and, and, and the fans came in there, hundreds of thousands. And we thought, here we go, WSL has got to be absolutely round. There'll be 10,000, 15,000 at the games. And then we got hit by the, the, the pandemic. And I think yeah. that's really, I think that is the only thing that's kind of holding those, holding the game, the game back at the moment. I really do, because everything's in place, I think. Yeah, but I just sort of think when those gates are opened, you know, we saw it with golf, when people could go back and play golf. Suddenly golf has been on this, massive boom like the driving ranges had queues coming out the door because it was the only place you could go like the minute the doors open on the WSL people want to go and watch football matches again and I think there is I think it could be positive although it's not been positive of course across any of this but I think when people are allowed to go back to sporting events there's going to be such a desire to go and be part of that again if you're a Chelsea fan you know go King's Meadow and watch the girls because you're gonna see goals and you're gonna see some of the best players in the world 
And I just think that that might happen for like across the WSL. I hope it happens. And I hope yeah, I it happens throughout the football leagues as well. Yeah, I think in time in time it will happen. What's um what's Ailey? What's what's in that tunnel for Ailey? What what's she trying to get to? Where's where's, where, where's your dream? Because at the moment you're doing so well and you're doing all the TV you want to do. Is there more for you? Do you want to grab more? Is there a new job you want to do? I felt like you just put me in a pretty woman moment there. What's your dream? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be happy to fulfil it for you. Um, oh, I, do you know what? It's really hard. Obviously, I want to work on on the biggest events. Um, I did a Winter Olympics. I've never done a Summer Olympics. I've done a Women's World Cup. I've never done a Men's World Cup. Um, so those are big, big events that I'd love, love to work in. You know, I'd, I'd love to work. And I'm so hopeful that this summer will be the summer. I'd love to work on a men's football tournament with Scotland there. I've done a women's one and it was that opening game between Scotland and England and France is one of the best things I've ever worked on. Just to see all the kilts and the streets in Nice and hear the anthem being played in a big event, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that with the men's team, hopefully, hopefully this summer. Um, and yeah, just I just want to keep developing and keep getting better. I mean, I'm very. I feel in terms of my presenter career, I'm I'm very new to it still. Um, I've got a lot to learn still, and a lot to improve on. And I just kind of at the moment want to keep doing that. I don't want to. The important thing for me is that I don't ever want to stand still. Mm. I always want to try and keep moving forward and even if it's just little things, not necessarily in terms of what I work on and how much work I do, but in terms of how, like my own personal development within the roles that I do. Um, and I'm lucky, you know, you talk about leaders, I've got a lot of people around me who who give me feedback and who help me with that. Um, people who are in the industry, people who are outside of the industry, friends, family, you know, lovely Joe, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so if there was, so, only if there was, if there was, Let's say you wanted to say thank you or, or just acknowledge two people that you have who have helped you along the way. Who would you who would you name check? If you were to name check two people that have really helped are either leading you or just nudging you in the right, the right direction. Wow, two people, that's really hard to like narrow it down. I've already mentioned there's lots, I would imagine there's lots, but if you know you, you, there, there'll be two that you that stick into your mind, that come to your mind, and you'll think, well, they were really kind to me. Well, I think always Hazel. Always yeah. Hazel Arvin for that inspiration, for paving the way, for showing me what's possible. And then for when I have worked with her or met her, you know, I wrote her a letter when I was 14 years old <laughs> and she wrote back to me, yeah, asking like how how I how I could get a career like hers. Um she's she's always been an inspiration for me. And she's always been, you know, to now sort of have her as someone who you know she's always said if you want to give me a call anytime you know and wow. she was amazing when I took over the golf from her because um we did one of the masters her last masters I went out as kind of to shadow her um and it was she was brilliant you know she was so good with me and That's yeah great. That is great. so she's she all be the one Without knowing, <laughs> without her ever knowing this, yeah. she she has been someone that I've always looked up to. And she's a phenomenal broadcaster. She's absolutely, I, I think she's absolutely one of the best. Her knowledge is out of this world. Um, and she's just, you know, she's great, faultless she? on air. So she's, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like she's been someone without actually even knowing that she's been someone probably. Good on you. Apart well, from this you've got, well, you've actually got, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to wear... She is, you've got to where she was, good hard work, you know, through lots of red tape and having to work a bit harder than I had to work or, you know, <laughs> footballers had to work. So I can only say, uh, Ailey, thanks very much first and foremost for joining me. Um, congratulations uh, for, for getting where you have. And that's uh, unfortunately the end of our Leaders Chain conversation for this series. Um, thanks for joining me. I've loved it. Thanks, Dion. It's good to see you.